Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful afternoon and a good rest of your evening for all my European viewers out there. Today, we are joined by the ever-wonderful poet, uh, Mr. Panama Hat. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing very well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm uh, very much looking forward to this because it's a topic I can talk talk a lot about. And I think it's um, very important for the right in general um, to have an understanding of these sorts of things. Um, so, yes, um, I think it's going to be a good evening. I think so as well. This is a very fun topic. Um, as there's quite a lot of good books on this, uh, Peter Kemp's books are very great, uh, first-hand accounts, as well as, um, I believe, Franco has Franco's personal autobiographies, if I'm correct about that. Um, but, yes, though it's surprisingly um, difficult to get a good copy of that. Um, it's, uh, you'd think it might be more in print, even in academic circles, but quite tricky. Uh, probably not, <laughs> considering the fact that all institutions are controlled by uh, Republican sympathizers, which we'll get into later, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean? But why is Franco important? Well, <laughs> Franco's important uh, for the fact that he actually won. You know, we talk about this all the time, you know? Um, here lies conservatism, here lies uh, right-wing regimes that have died. Well, actually, we can win um, if applied correctly um, and not stupidly. Um, I think Franco has showed this. Uh, it is very much possible, and uh, indeed was the norm, actually, in most of modern society were up until uh, the World War II uh, era. Um, yes. I mean, for a start, it's a, it's a rare... Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's rare the right word. It's rare the, bleh, sorry. It's rare the right word um, when it comes to successful right-wing or reactionary or kind of anti-communist rebellions against the left um, you know, is, is this a kind of rare example of, of a success, you know, especially, especially since, you know, it wasn't just a rebellion, it turned into a, a fully fledged sort of crusade to rid Spain of the, um, of the sort of, uh, of the, of, of the reds that were seemed to be, you know, causing so much trouble and kind of, and kind of ruining the country. Um, and of course, Franco is the, is the, he, he begins as the figurehead of the movement and very quickly becomes its leader um, and is able to rule Spain until his death in the 1970s. Um, and I think alongside um, the dictator uh, prime minister of Portugal, um, uh, Salazar, he is sort of a, one of these strange figures who kind of comes out of the pre-Second World War era you know, all the way up to the 1970s, you know, it's well, well into the memory of many people around now who, you know, aren't, aren't even that old um, com comparatively. So, you know, it's a, it's, an, it's a very interesting case. And it's also interesting to look at how uh, Spain is an example of how you might run a um, an anti-leftist or kind of traditionalist, anti-democratic, anti-liberal country. Um, which should be taken note of, I think, you know, we should look at the successes and the failures of that regime and see kind of, you know, what they did in relation to civil organization, religion, education, etc. There's, there's I mean, there's still a huge amount of things to be talked over, which we really should do. I mean, um, I still want to do this kind of long series on it with Turnip um, and bringing in others as well, you know, because it's just, there's a lot to unpack. And, you know, at, at this point I've spent, what are we looking at now? five, six years, more or less. I mean, in serious, quite serious um, study of the Civil War and, and the kind of history of Spain in that period. And I mean, certainly enough to have written a, a couple of lengthy dissertations on it. So, <laughs> um, I mean, it, I, I may as well, you know, use that information to, to get it out there. Well, I think that makes you an expert, as we all know. As soon as you, you know, as soon as you have enough uh, based information to write a dissertation, you are the expert automatically. Uh, <laughs> considering the fact that most historians are extremely low IQ, you know, uh, libtards who aren't really going to tell you anything valuable other than uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, a certain country in the Middle East good, <laughs> you know. Well, I mean, that's, that's liberal economics. <laughs> That's what shocked me about most history teachers I encountered in school and, and that people told me about in other schools was, was how little they really seemed to care about history. You know, they were just kind of there to, you know, absorb some information from a textbook and then regurgitate it to students um, and that kind of thing. Um, and just as a point on um, Spanish Civil War historical writing, 
Um, the interesting thing is that it's it's one of the most openly ideological fields of history, I think. Um, authors generally tie their colors to the mast. Um, I mean, for example, one of the major Anglo historians on the Civil War is um, Paul Preston, um, who is kind of an old school. Uh, he's, he's, he's from Liverpool um, here in the UK, and he's, he's kind of very old school trade union left winger um, who you know, has always been that way. And he's, his, his, he, he's, a, he's a very talented historian. Um, and he's done a he, he's done, he spends his life, you know, researching a lot of the time in Spain, going through the archives, you know, he's, he's, and he's written a, a fantastic biography on Franco, which is an enormous, enormous book. Um, probably the most detailed one out there in English anyway. And, um, but he, you know, he, he does nail his colors to the mask, as I said. So, you know, he's 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 a kind of republic apologist. You know, <laughs> the, the the republic didn't do anything wrong, and it was these evil evil right wingers and landowners and, and and military leaders who came and ruined it and took Spain back to the dark ages. You know, type thing. Um, I, I would say if you if you want the 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 most fair history in the Anglo speaking world of the Spanish Civil War, you should go to um, Doctor Stanley Payne, um, who you know takes a very tries to keep as neutral line as he can. He he is very very um, kind of fair handed in dealing with the problems of the republic. Um, he's written a book, in fact, called "The Second Spanish Republic," dealing explicitly with why the republic failed. And his argument is basically that it was it you know it was it was a contradictory mess in which leftist politicians weren't didn't they they, they the, le the leftist the leftist politicians couldn't trust the right wing with the republic so they would rather destroy it than than let the right you know win an election or, or get a prime minister or a president in which then you know obviously that wasn't going to work they started assassinating opposition leaders and before you knew it it was into a civil war um and of course there, there are quite a few more um pro-franco biographies uh, biograph um, hi histories of the war Unfortunately, I, I shouldn't prepare. I don't remember the uh, the name of the main one off the top of my head, but there was an anti-communist uh, British historian and, and I think later member of parliament um, who wrote a very pro-Franco um, book on the Civil War, which is, you know, makes for mu much nicer reading for us. But um, yeah. <laughs> you, you obviously have to take the sort of ideological factors into account when you're writing history. So anyway, yeah, don't want to ramble too much. No, I think the second Spanish Civil War is the most like, clear-cut example of ideological uh, division that it's like finest example. Uh, mm -hmm. The cleavages of society are shown like quite uh, openly. Uh, shockingly, mm -hmm. shockingly. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's a kind of classical case of what happens when a country is split between two irreconcilable visions, you know, for, for the, for the future. I mean, you, you can't have traditionalist Catholic, rural spain alongside international socialist spain you can't you can't have two of them together they, they can't coexist they they have to fight and i mean you know what inspired that long stream with turnip was the fact that um whenever i hear news from america it always looks to me like that's what's happening where you have two utterly contradictory views views for how the republic should be and you can't have them coexist they that you you, it, it can't simply go on as a democracy. Not not that I don't not that I think America ever really was in the classical sense, but that's a whole other topic. But you can't go on with, you know, kind of um, uh, Republican, I suppose, or, or well, that's not really a fair term, is it? But you know, more sort of Republican aligned, Christian, traditionalist. Um, should we should we say? Um, racially realist america that can't coexist with you know drag queen story hour you know um you know uh racial wokeness and all that it, they, they, those two those two visions of what american society should be can't coexist not that it's really a fair comparison because i don't think that the the, the people pushing all the you know wokeness um racial upheaval etc they don't actually want that as a, as a future option they're, they're, they're just using it to destroy destroy what's already there you know it's a weapon so it's, i it's think not... that was the most like shocking thing after watching that whole stream was just like 
like wow these people really don't change in their tactics like <laughs> no. in terms of like persecuting the political opposition you know like election fortification you know yeah i mean like anarcho tyranny <laughs> I, I i watched this like funny interview um this slide i think it was from the bbc this they had this great documentary or something like that and they interviewed like a bunch of old these old veterans from the factions and there was this one like communist girl who was like as soon as i got out i went straight to the prison to release all my comrades yeah we were going after the right wingers mm -hmm. and i'm like this is the definition of anarcho tyranny right right here um, yeah that was a that was a big thing in spain was thinking of in, in fact i mean so the I'm, I'm you'd be probably aware that uh in 1936 in february there was a, a, a major election um in which you know the left unifies into a popular front the right unifies around the um the theda um the kind of traditionalist conservative group and these two juggernauts these political sort of you know heavyweights go at it and this is you know th this is it this is the vote that's going to decide the future of spain now it, it is it is obvious in hindsight, and many Spanish historians have done research into it. And um, Stanley Payne is also of the opinion that this was a completely rigged election. Um, the left was stuffing ballot boxes and preventing known conservatives or Catholics from from casting votes. Um, so it was fortified anyway. But even so, the elections were basically a draw. I mean, it was almost literally Spain was split fifty fifty. Between the, between the two factions. Um, and despite that, at, you know, they, they had barely begun counting the result and leftist mobs went around the streets saying, the revolution is here, the revolution is here, you know, and they threw open jails. They let all kinds of criminals out of jails back, back onto the streets and, you know, sacked the houses of right-wingers and burned right-wing newspapers, you know. It, this, is, this is all par for the course when it comes to that, that level of political hatred. I mean, you know, the, the, the only difference, I think, in terms of the, uh, why it's not like that already in America, or not not really in the same way, is because in Spain at that time, the right and the left were both independent of each other, and both are willing to fight. Whereas in in America now, the what is left of the right wing isn't really willing to fight or can't fight. It doesn't it doesn't have the same backing or the same platform or the same ability that the right did in Spain in 1936. So it's not really a fair comparison again, but. There is definitely some room for comparison, you know, where when it comes to um, the fact that these these two sides are, are, are you know, ir irreconcilable. And I mean, you mentioned um, a, a film clip. I remember seeing one um, that was filmed in the seventies, and they were speaking to um, uh, a, 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 he was very old then, but he had been a, a kind of he had been a fascist youth when he in the thirties. He had joined the um, the Falange and uh, been a militant when he was in his early twenties. And he said that at that at that point, when it got to that point in Spain, when he saw a socialist or a communist walking down the street, he didn't see a person who was a communist. He saw the, he saw the devil. You know, you 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 don't see people anymore. You just see something that has to be destroyed. And I, you know, it, it's again. I think America is definitely well on the course to that. So we'll have to see. But, um, I think we're already there, except we just don't have. I mean, I mean, unless you count anarcho tyranny, we don't have the open assassinations yet. I mean, but we're starting not to see yet. that now with some people. Not yet. <laughs> some staffers being stabbed, but I mean, it's not there yet. We're heading in no. that direction. Uh, they, they already have the hatred openly for us, except. Oh, yes. Uh, it's not like we can really fight back in the, any serious way. Um, no, but, but we'll, unfortunately, we'll, we'll just have to see, won't we? Yeah. Yes, but just like it was just striking, like how much these tactics they use, you know, mm. fortification, the jails, using the unions. Like seizing the institutions like from the right and then also once they gain local power, like even at a local level, their first goal was immediately to suppress the right wing and punish them. It was just immediately like the first thing that these people will said. I'm just like, yeah, it's, it's just like the, the two mindsets are so different. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for me, the, the absolute breaking point, I think, was seeing the mobs around the um, uh, summer 2020, you know, I mean. It just just the sight of basically what were in realistic terms government sponsored mobs, you know, regime sponsored mobs, going around and just you know spouting, you know, spurious ide ideo ideological points, looting shops, causing harm, getting into fights, you know, terrorizing communities. I mean, 
you know, if, if the Republic can do that to its own people, then I think it may already be quite far gone. You know, unfortunately, I, I will I will go out there and say, unfortunately, America does not seem to have a Franco figure <laughs> who can come and save it. Um, but, you know, we can't predict the future, can we? So. No, we cannot. But we can learn the lessons from people who were successful at defeating the left. Yes. So one of the first things that I think is very important that Franco did, even though he was him. Him personally, he was not an ideologue. He was a very uh, pragmatist, an absolute pragmatist. In terms oh, yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, what needed to be done to consolidate the factions in order to be genuine opposition. Now, some people could say this is cynical for his own power, but it's like, well, you know, you need to crush uh, the enemies <laughs> of evil. So it's like, well, you can either let them, you know, sit back and uh, kind of bicker or fight, you know, as, as a unified front against your enemies here. Well, um, I think it's so. So, I mean, first of all, I, I think I think we should say the the the, the sort of um, uh, de jour topic of this stream is how it's about specifically how Franco united the Spanish right wing um, in a struggle in order to defeat the left, who were much more divided. Um, but it's also worth saying, you know, uh, I mean, so let's just. I want to go into Franco's background a bit because you pointed out his pragmatism there. Um, it's not that just he was pragmatic. He was, he was, he was a complete enigma, even to those who knew him, you know, you, you couldn't, you never, you never knew what Franco wanted or what he was going to do. Um, and in all the years that I've been reading about him, researching him, trying to get to understand this figure, I genuinely cannot decide one way or the other. I'm completely torn whether he was a very, very shrewd, calculating man who worked his way up to the top deliberately, or whether it was pure luck being in the right place and just, you know, that ability to not sort of declare his colors either way on any, on any real issue that just sort of got him up there. I can't decide whether it was basically, you know, fortune or planning or, I mean, obviously there's probably a bit of both, but you know what I mean? There's no, there's no real way to, to decisively tell. I mean, so, for a start, he was born in Galicia, um, which is in the right in the northwestern corner of Spain, just north of Portugal, um, near uh, La Coruña. And the the so this region of Spain, the people that come from there are called Gallegos, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and the, they have a reputation, you know, like Franco was, for being extremely buttoned up, very difficult to tell. And there's a there's a popular expression in Spain, which which in English would basically mean if you meet a Gallego on the stairs, you can't tell if he's going up or down. If you see what I mean, <laughs> there's a, you know, completely inscrutable people either way. So that comes into it. And um, I mean, I would say he his, his you know, his his father was uh, was, I think, quite a radical man, um, quite a quite a strong progressive. If I remember, I think he may have actually been involved in liberal politics. Um, before Franco was born. Um, but he was also a bit of a tearaway type, and he abandoned Franco and his three brothers, uh, sorry, his two brothers and mother alone while he went off, I think possibly to start another family, if I remember correctly. Um, and, you know, so whereas Franco's mother was a deeply, deeply Catholic, you know, fervently Catholic, conservative, um, who you know instilled in him a kind of def definitive love for tradition so you know franco was never a, a kind of as you say he was never an ideologue who kind of you know read up on political theory or, or or philosophy he was just a kind of instinctive man of order and a man of tradition particularly when it came to catholicism you know he he his his real understanding of what spain was was that it was fundamentally a catholic nation you know Isabella and Ferdinand um, had driven the Moors out. They drove out the Muslims and, you know, stuck in the cross for, for the Catholic Church. And to him, that was the foundation of the modern Spanish nation. So that was the most important thing, you know, ab above above all else, really. And also just, you know, he, he sent off to military academy when he's, you know, 13. You know, he doesn't he doesn't get a normal education like we would now where you get sent off to, you know, primary school, high school. He's given a he's given his basic schooling and at 13 military academy. So from 13 to 17, he's all of his 
education is received through military training, basically. So you would be educated on, you know, history, mathematics or whatever, while you were being trained up to be an officer in the Spanish army. Um, just as an extra um, bit of info to that, he wants to be, he wants to join the Navy um, because his father, I think, was a, a, a former naval officer. He came from a, a, a town, I think uh, El Farol, I want to say, or possibly it may have been La Coruña, where there was a major Spanish naval base. So he was always surrounded by sailors and ships and things. And he loved, he loved that sort of thing. But right when he goes to join up, Spain suffers a crushing military defeat in the Spanish-American War, which is something we should probably cover separately as well, because that's a very interesting episode in the history of uh, both Spain and America, isn't it? Um, but yes, he, he can't join the Navy because the, the Spanish fleet has been destroyed and they're not taking on any new officers or men for a couple of years. So rather than wait all that time, he joins the Army Academy instead. Um, and so, yes, he and he he and he's a kind of classic Spanish nationalist type, you know, a kind of, you, you could almost call him a sort of, you know, typical hobbledehoy of the period where he's, you know, comes out of the military academy and he has, he has a very simple but very powerful understanding of Spain and he's willing to fight for that vision of Spain, basically. Um, so, yes. Another thing and, I like about him sorry. is that uh, he wasn't just all talk or show. He was actually willing to go do this himself in person. Um, he oh, showed yeah. himself to be very brave in the Rift Wars, which Spain fought over Absolutely. in Morocco against Absolutely. the barbarian tribes. And I'll use that word literally because these people were, <laughs> as you'll soon describe well, about what happened, uh, barbarians. Uh, well, I mean, yes, it was a particularly brutal war he fought. And just, just for a bit of um, context, from um, the early 1900s um, up to the uh, early 1930s, Spain is engaged in a, a military campaign in North Africa. Um, they, they, they control a strip of territory um, called the Rif, um, which, which basically contains the, the Rif mountain range. Um, it's a very, very tiny strip. Of, there's, not, there's not a huge amount of, of you know, important things there, but there are two Spanish cities there, which have been there since, um, since, the, since they kicked the Moors out, I think. You know, these two Spanish enclaves. Um, on the north coast of Africa. So there's, they have to kind of, you know, protect those and such. And um, this war has been dragging on. The Spanish army is particularly incompetent and corrupt, and it doesn't do particularly well. And there's a huge defeat at Anwal in the early 20s, and, it, it, you know, te terrible, terrible things. And Franco is involved in this. I mean, this th th that war in Africa is the foundation of who Franco is, really, other than his earlier experiences. Um, he joins up as a, a junior lieutenant, obviously, coming out of the um, uh, of the academy, and um, serves in Africa from uh, 1912 uh, up to um, I think more or less 1917, 1920 permanently. But he's back and forth to Africa um, in, in in between those. But it's a lot more peaceful, and so there's less to do there. But yes, he's he's almost you know almost i mean this is a weird thing to say maybe but almost brainlessly brave in his conduct you know this is a man who will stand up and walk around you know without crouching on open ground when there's when there's bullets flying and you know all these things when everyone's ducking for cover he'll just be standing there with his little sort of you know little wooden stick you know giving orders to the men and pointing out where they have to go and things um and it must be said this war in morocco the Moroccan tribesmen, of course, because they're fighting a kind of um, irregular war, will deliberately pick off officers um, from the Spanish army. They will, they will, you know, um, deliberately shoot anyone wearing an officer's braid. And it's said that the war is so deadly for Spanish officers that they will come home one of two ways, either in a coffin or with a general sash, um, because, you know, generals in Spain are given a red sash to wear traditionally. And, you know, the, the, the idea is that if you don't die, everyone else will, and you'll end up being promoted up the ranks, you know, like, like a rocket, <laughs> because everyone else will be dead, um, which in a sense did happen. You know, he was, um, he ends up a captain by the time he leaves Africa, I think, and then he's, he's a major by the early 20s. Um, and, uh, you know, his, his rise through the ranks is very rapid. He's a, he, he, in fact, he becomes a general um in I'm trying to think when it would be uh 
I think the early 30s, I think possibly 30, 1931 or 1936. I can't remember, but he he's he, he, he's aged 33 at the time um, or something like that. And he's he's the youngest man to obtain the rank of general in Europe since Napoleon. Um, I believe, which is you know quite a quite a quite a thing to thing to do, um, and he was a very skilled officer. Yes, um, very very brave. He is actually shot. He's shot during the war through the stomach um, while leading an attack, and this w he came so close. It was thought he was about to die because they were in the middle of the desert. Supply was miles away. The bases were miles away. Stomach wounds were normally fatal because you know your all your internal organs are completely messed up. And um, the, the medical the medical corps out there wasn't particularly good. Um, but it's thought that it, he's, he's able to make it back and he's a, he lives. And the surgeon who, who sees to his wounds says that he was able to survive because the, as the bullet hit his stomach, he was breathing in. And if his diaphragm had been relaxed rather than tensed, he would have died. I don't know the exact medical science behind it, but apparently that is the case. So, you know. Um, and th because of the t he's he's commanding a detachment of uh, Moroccan troops who are loyal to Spain, um, fighting on the Moroccans basically. It's like a sort of tribal thing, like like how the the Brits have um, the Indian Army in India, you know, with lots of Indian soldiers. And they um, they all regard him as um, as blessed by Allah with with luck. They call it Baraka, which is basically somebody who is immune to bullets. You know, they they can't be killed no matter no matter what they do, and you know. If you're a sort of Moroccan soldier and you see this, you know, very short um, Spanish officer walking around on the top of the trench when there's, you know, all hell flying above you, you, you may well believe that. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not purely in the realms of, of fantasy. I think he was genuinely quite blessed with with luck or fortune here. Um, and then, of course, I'll, I'll just briefly um, go through his rise to power. Um, so yes, he's given various uh, staff positions. He's made chief of the new General Military Academy in 1928, which he absolutely loves. Um, this is a, in uh, Zaragoza, Zaragoza, and um, he's he's in charge of um, training up officer recruits, and you know he he adores it. He he loves um, training up young men. He loves he loves the whole the whole ethos of the military academy, which is of course what he was formed in. Um, and in 1931. The new Republican Minister of War, uh, Manuel Afanya, shuts the military academy um, partially because he fears it's a hub of right-wing activity. Um, and for this, he will he will earn the ire of Franco, who because his his beloved academy was closed on a whim. And um, he this is part of the reason, in fact, why Franco was more keen to join the rebellion in 1936. Because it's it sounds petty, but it's true. You know, he was. He was very displeased that Afania, who I think had become president in 1936, um, had closed his academy. You know, so you know, be be careful what you go mucking around. And I suppose is the lesson there. Um, and then he's given various other commands. He's uh, exiled to the Canary Islands in early 1936 because he is um, he's a kind of famous war hero and a and a known conservative general. And the the Republic fears that he may be trying to lead a military uprising. So they send him off to the Canary Islands. And um, the generals in mainland Spain who are trying to plot the uprising keep asking Franco to join the rebellion. You know, we, we need your help. We're going we're gonna to do we're going to stage a coup and overthrow this Republic. And he doesn't really want anything to do with it. You know, or he's at least he's very inscrutable. He doesn't want to he doesn't want to, you know, vocally say yes, he won't join. He says, "Well, maybe if you do this and this, and it, they're so they've been infuriated by it, you know, why, why won't he join?" Of course, when the rebellion does kick off, he does join, um, and you know, he's 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 flown over from the Canary Islands to Morocco. Um, Adolf Hitler sends him transport planes to cross the um, Straits of Gibraltar to get back to lead his African troops into Spain, um, and then once he's there, he is more or less. Uh, voted by the generals the um titular commander of the of the hunter that's that's um declaring itself against the government and from there he becomes the de facto leader and and his power is unchallenged by the time the war ends well i mean it you know i'm saying that with with, with hindsight there, there were considerable challenges to his power 
in between then and the sort of 1950s. Um, but, you know, he pulls it off. And as I said, he rules Spain till he dies as regent. Um, so, yes, that's, that's, that's the kind of uh, political history of Franco. Um, so should we get on to the, um, the, the meat of the stream about, about how he was able to unite the right wing of Spain um, in, in contrast to the disparity of the left? Or do you have any comments on, um, on his career or anything? I would agree. It's very hard to tell with him because there's some extra normal circumstances in his life where it seems like there's just opportunities that just don't seem to add up there. Um, yeah. Like when he's exiled to uh, the uh, Balearic Islands. No, not, not the Balearic Islands, the Canary Islands. Canary Islands, yes. Though he, is, he is commander there. of the um, Balearic Islands for a brief period. Anyway. And uh, I believe his commanding officer is killed. Um, and that's why he's, uh, I forgot the exact reason why, but that's why he goes back to Spanish Morocco and takes charge of his African core, we'll call that. And then he ends up flying over the Straits with German and Italian help uh, to lead the right-wing cause against the Republican gover communist government, we'll say. It's hard to tell because it's mixed uh, with who's a communist, you know, seizing power at any one given time. Can you know how chaotic this republic was? Uh, <laughs> when we talk about politics now. Uh, but I would say it was it's hard to tell with him. Uh, so probably a mix of both. Uh, but yes, I say let's go ahead and get on to uh, how he was able to unify the right in a successful way and maintain uh, power for as long as he did. So it's, it's quite a difficult question to answer, actually, because um, it's, well, or at least it's rather complicated. So... Just as a bit of background, in Spain at the time, the right wing was divided between a number of factions. The, the main faction was the kind of um, mainstream conservative slash more radical political party, the, the FEDA, which is the uh, Confederación Español de Derechas Autónomas, which, which basically means autonomous confederation of spanish right wing right wing groups more, more or less um it uh it is led by uh, jose maria gil robles who um if you want more information on all this go watch the stream i did with turnip um uh, last year and uh it's uh that that is that is kind of it again it's centered around political catholicism it, it is in defense of property um, it's not. It's not totally stolid. It, it does. It does have a, a a kind of positive program for Spain. It wants to introduce, you know, some reforms which are, you know, genuinely needed. I think. Um, but it's. But it wants to maintain order, and it also wants to build a state in which it can dominate. Basically, it wants to set up a political um, system in which it will forever be in power, you know? So you, you will have this kind of solid right-wing block that will rule Spain, that will rule the Republic and keep Spain on its true path. Um, this is also somewhat related to the monarchy. The, the monarchy had been overthrown in 1931, again, in a what was probably a, well, it's ironic because it, it's, it's an election basically between pro-monarchist and anti-monarchist parties. The monarchists win the election um, but the left basically seizes the momentum and says, right, that's it. You know, we, we won. Um, the, the king is worried about a civil war. Um, and the head of the military goes to the king and says that he can't count on the loyalty of officers or men to defend the monarchy in the event of a, of an uprising. So the king flees Spain with his wife and family. Um, he does not abdicate. That's a the, the, that's a whole other thing, but he he doesn't abdicate. He um he simply he simply leaves the country. So the republic is declared, you know, by default. And some on the right wing are monarchists who want to bring back King Alfonso, who fled in 1931. Um, and as people will know, some are Carlists who are, are much more traditionalist, much more Catholic, much more kind of medieval um integralist in their views they 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 want they want an end to parliamentary democracy they want to establish a more municipal style spain 
where it's very local. Every county, every town, every kind of village has its own minor political system. Again, that's a very, very drastic simplification. And the car lists are quite difficult to actually pin down exactly what they want because a lot of them are just, you know, illiterate farmers from the north of the country who, you know, wear a, 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 a red beret and are, are opposed to the um, Bourbon monarchy or the, that particular branch of it anyway. Um, but yes, the uh, but the, this group of the right, the, the Theda, they basically take what is called an accidentalist policy, where they say that with the monarchy or without the monarchy, doesn't matter. As long as we rule the country, we can keep Spain true to its roots as, you know, a Catholic, traditionalist, um, sort of, um, you know, propertied country, I suppose, you know. Um, Feder is backed by kind of the Catholic middle class and working class uh, landowners, industrialists, you know, and anybody that's got any sort of bone to pick with the left. Um, there's, as I said, I've mentioned the Carlists. Uh, there's also the Falange, who are uh, a very radical, um, basically kind of Italian style fascist group in, in, you know, quotation marks, because they adopt the kind of radical attitude of the Italian fascists and the and the German national socialists, but obviously they're much more Catholic. But they're also very very reformist. They're not they're not traditionalists when it comes to economics. They want um, a much more you might say socialistic or statist economy. You know they 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 are much more kind of pro working class in the terms of the in terms in, in terms of what they agitate for. Um, they are attacked by other right wingers as being basically proto socialists, um, and as being you know um, you know a bunch of a bunch of kind of um, pistol wielding radicals. They they they're never able to get mass support. The the uh, Falange they are they they're always frustrated by the fact that they're a fairly small party, generally run by the sons of aristocrats you know kind of rich right-wing youth and um, they're never able to shed that image so they never really have much appeal to the masses which they claim to um but they are still a considerable force and they they, they will get more powerful as the war goes on so that's more or less it there are lots of much smaller right-wing parties you know agrarians and uh other minority things and you know region lists of, of both right and left um and this is what Franco is faced with. So he, I mean, all the areas of Spain that fall to the coup, which as, as you can see on the map there, the areas in gray. So I, I better explain. So there's a, there's a coup, the military attempts a coup on um, uh, July. Dear me, I should remember the exact date, shouldn't I? 1936. Uh, That's the year, though. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's it's July 1936. Well, I mean, okay, so the it officially it's triggered on the 18th, but it, it does it takes a few days. Um, military units all over the country rise up in revolt against the republic. In some areas, they're they're you know it's Im immediately successful. Um, in other areas, they're um, they're defeated. So, you know, the, and, it, and it's a huge a huge variation. So in Madrid the government gets ahead of the situation. They give out arms to workers and socialist masses who surround all the barracks and basically put the troops to a siege. And they all, all of the troops that attempt to rebel are gunned down. Um, in places like Salamanca, as you can see on the map there, which was a, a quite a right-wing stronghold, um, they take it more or less effortlessly. In Seville, there is they struggle, but the, but the military ends up winning. In Pamplona, in the north, the uprising was celebrated like a festival. You know, <laughs> all of the, um, all of the, you know, because that, that one of the kind of um, cliche, you know, images Third of Spain. Part of this war, <laughs> the Basque. Well, I mean, you know, what, one of the images we have of Spain is sort of men in men in white clothes with with red sashes and berets, you know, running around with bulls and eating olives. I mean, that is that's actually Pampl that, that that kind of culture is Pamplona. It's where they have the running of the bulls and everything. Um, and, you know, they literally have a big festival. They have celebratory bullfights and all the local bigwigs come out and everyone eats and drinks and feasts and goes, you know, Olé to the revolution or whatever, well, to the rebellion. Um, you know, and whereas in some areas, as I said, brutal, brutal um, fighting and, 
many, many right-wing officers who attempt to lead the coup in those areas are killed. Um, and quite a number of right-wing figures are killed um, killed in jail or killed because they happen to be in a leftist area once the war breaks out. Um, I will say the leader of the Falange is um, uh, the young Jose, uh, Jose Primo de Rivera, Jose Antonio, he's, he's generally called, who is the son of, he's, he's an aristocrat, the son of um, a previous Spanish dictator from the 1920s, also called uh, Primo de Rivera. And um, what, so one, one of Franco's earliest kind of, okay, I'm, I'm getting better. I'm so, sorry for the totally chaotic way of telling this, but it's such a intertwined story. It's, it's, quite, it's quite difficult to separate piece by piece. Um, so, Basically, yeah, Franco joins the rebellion, flies from the Canary Islands, flies his 30,000 very, very good, experienced, brutalist Moroccan, brutalist, brutal Moroccan soldiers over the Straits of Gibraltar into Seville, where they begin cutting a path through Spain um, very quickly, very efficiently, because, you know, these are experienced native soldiers from a very, very bloodthirsty war. Um, so they have absolutely no trouble dealing with, you know, a couple of leftist peasants with old rifles, you know, no, no match at all. Um, and Franco is being tipped as a leader because he's, he's a well-known war hero who's a, you know, a kind of, uh, a good military leader and who is, you know, he, he isn't, he isn't some politician with a ideolo ideological baggage train that everyone's going to have to, you know, deal with. He's a simple soldier a hero, and he he has a basic understanding of the what they're fighting for. So he's a, already tipped as a leader. All the leading generals of the coup, or I should say, the surviving generals of the coup, meet in um, Burgos in the north or Burgos, and um, they have a they basically vote. And I think with one one exception, they all vote for Franco to be the unified leader. Um, again, you have to bear in mind that at this time, the generals aren't exactly sure what they've rebelled for. So initially, the coup is just to seize control of the Republic and stop it sliding into anarchy. Because since the, the election in February, Spain has been descending into chaos. As we talked about earlier, leftists are shooting opponents, burning churches, killing priests and nuns. Um, the banks are collapsing all the money's being pulled out you know it's absolutely falling into chaos the police can't control the streets anymore you know terrible stuff so the military is revolting initially right we have to seize control set up a dictatorship clean up the republic which is why a number of republican fairly left-wing uh, intellectuals and even in some cases politicians support the uprising because they think oh great well the military will you know stop the anarchy and we can get back to normal you know, the, the Republic's fallen on its way a bit, but we'll get it back up. Um, the, this is complicated because some officers are monarchists, some are more radical. So immediately, the these generals have to decide, well, what actually are we doing? You know, are we Republicans? Are we bringing back the king? You know, are we setting up something? You know, are we handing power to the civilian right-wingers? You know, it's it's all up for grabs. And this is... This begins to become um, clear set when Franco raises the old Spanish flag in his headquarters. So the old Spanish flag is the is the bicolor. It's red, red and yellow stripe, right? The Republican Spanish flag is red, yellow, purple with a purple stripe at the bottom. And Franco takes down this flag and puts up the old flag, which is the monarchist flag. And slowly, the other generals do the same thing which is sort of automatically leaning it towards, right, we are somewhat done with the Republic. You know, this isn't about the Republic anymore. We're, we're bringing back, we're bringing back old Spain. Um, but anyway, the, <laughs> again, so sorry for the chaotic nature of explaining this, but to get back to the point about Primo de Rivero, he is, again, a fairly young aristocratic son of a former pr um, dictatorial pr prime minister, he leads the Falange. He's all about, you know, radical fascist style politics. His party does not have mass support, but he, because of his um, society connections and because of his, he has a seat in parliament. He's a very, very prominent right wing politician. Um, and he is, 
arrested by leftists at the outset of the rebellion. He's in Madrid at the time. And he is shot. He is taken out and shot immediately because he's a very famous right wing figure. And the leftists, you know, well, obviously they can't help themselves. Um, and what he then does, is, well, sorry, what Franco then does is despite the fact that technically him and the Falange are, are opposed, he sets up a cult around the death of Primo de Rivera. He, he kind of, he has all these propaganda posters printed of Primo de Rivera, you know, as the martyr, you know, the, the idea that he died so that Spain could be great again, if that makes sense. Um, and so this is the first rung, I think, o other than him winning the support of the generals, this is the first rung of his, um, of his, uh, of his road to unifying the right wing in Spain. You know, he, as I said, uses the image of a man that he would otherwise have str struggled for power with in order to boost his own image because he's able to kind of leapfrog off of that onto being right. I am the inheritor of the, of the legacy of Primo de Rivera. You know, I, I take up his mantle. So immediately that wins him a lot of support. Um, the next thing that happens is, so as I said, Franco's African army is landed in Seville and they're moving outwards, pushing, pushing leftists back all through the countryside. Now, Madrid has been abandoned by the Republican government. They've moved to Valencia on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. And the generals are all in agreement, right, Madrid, straight away, we take Madrid, put an end to this, you know, we, have, we, we need the capital if we're going to win. But Franco disagrees with this um to much opposition from his generals and staff they're all kind of you know what are you doing he says no we're not going to go for madrid i'm sending the army of africa to toledo which is south of madrid um on the way from on the way from seville as you can see it's just um to the left of madrid there to the south on the map the reason he goes to toledo is because in toledo there is a large building called the the alcafa which is um you know a kind of big uh so it's, it's a religious building, isn't it? Or basically a, a big fort, um, a very big, uh, I think, medieval um, or, or Baroque structure, um, a very, very large fortress, basically. In and what has happened is in Toledo, the coup failed and a load of right-wing civilians and soldiers are hemmed in in the Alcafa, surrounded by leftists. And the leftists are bringing in artillery and they're using airplanes and they've got bombs and they're digging under the walls you know so there's this intense siege ha happening in in toledo surrounded by leftists um and franco says no we're not going to madrid we're going to toledo we have to relieve the alcatha now bear in mind there are only a, i believe uh i think at most a few thousand i think probably more like a few hundred soldiers in this alcatha there are civilians in there as well but in military terms, it really means nothing. You know, Madrid really is the strategically sound option here. You know, that's why all the Germans say, right, why don't we take Madrid? But Franco is able to see a propaganda opportunity in this because he goes to Toledo, relieves the siege, drives off the leftists, and is greeted by the jubilant, you know, the women and children and the soldiers trapped inside this fort for, you know, I think weeks and weeks. Um, you know, and the, the the point is, it's a it's a really good symbolic aspect of the struggle. You know, look 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 at these people. They 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 withstood weeks of 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 death and torture and war because they believed in the right wing cause in the the, the crusade against the left. And of course, Franco is seen as the hero of the Alcatha. He saved the Alcatha from the leftists. He relieved the siege. You know, like like um, El Cid, you know the great the great Spanish knight. Um, and there is a there is a um, uh, I believe Franco does actually have a kind of what we might call a, an El Cid uh, complex um, when it comes to that. He he does see himself as a kind of knight of Spain who needs to cleanse it of its enemies. And of course, Toledo is the first engagement of the war in which all the foreign press, journalists, news cameras, and film cameras are there. And so what do we have? We have all the press there 
And there is Franco triumphantly marching around the Alcazar, you know, being hugged and greeted and kissed by the inhabitants who have survived the siege. And he is the hero. You know, he is the face being broadcast around the world now in all the papers and all the films, etc. Franco is clearly the leader. So that's one thing that he is. He has set himself up as the de facto leader, whether or not whether or not anyone wants anything different or anybody, you know, the Carlists or the Falange, whether they want their own leaders. Franco is clearly the face of the right wing front that is now forming to fight the upcoming civil war. Another thing I would like to mention quickly is that Toledo also uh, symbolically is Spain's uh, medieval capital. Yes, uh, yes. I should have mentioned that, yes. Which also plays into role into why uh, he would deviate the goal from, you know, the generals who want to obviously take the capital first, but um, this more symbolic target is probably more immediately uh, easier yeah. to capture compared to the more fortified and hostile population of Madrid. Yes. Um... <laughs> Yes, and as, as you say, the, the the real genius of Franco giving up Madrid um, in order to take Toledo is, you know, the the, sim the symbolic value. He 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 has this instinctive, traditional understanding of what Spain is in terms of symbology and medieval heritage and the idea of the crusade to drive out the enemy. He understands this instinctively, and he realizes what he has to do. You know, in order to build up credibility and build up, um, I don't want to say propaganda because it sounds too crude, you know, but he has to build up a mythology. You know, the, a, a young Spanish army officer in the early 1900s would have been inundated with stories about El Fid and the Crusades against the Moors and, you know, is Isabella the Catholic driving them out. You know, he, he, gets, he gets it, basically, is the way to put it. He gets how spain functions on that mythological level and he's able to take advantage of it and this, this is I, i'm going to keep stressing this because it's a very very important point is that if you're going to have this kind of metaphysical crusade against your enemies you need a mythology and you need you need symbology and you need a spiritual understanding almost of what you're doing it can't just be material you know it, it can't just be um i'm going to do this because you know um they burn my farm or something, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to do that, but you, you, you've got to elevate it, I think, to another level. And of course, you know, this brings right wingers to his side. You know, if you're a skeptical Carlist or a phalan phalanist who, you know, is, you know, has reasons to dislike Fra Franco or you, you don't trust him, this is what will bring you over. You know, the, 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 the new knight, the new hero of Spain, you know, who's, who's, who's driving out the reds from your symbolic, uh, symbolic capital. You know, this is a very, very important event in the development of the war. Um, but yes, anyway, um, any thoughts on that? No, I think it's very important. Uh, he's capturing the Spanish mythology, um, kind of the, the heritage of their culture here, um, you know, by capturing this ancient, the medieval capital, like the cultural capital, where um, the city was the prize of many of the uh, earliest um, reconquista people who could only dream of recapturing the ancient uh, Visigothic capital of Toledo yes. and the Moors. Uh, only they could dream of doing something like that in like a day or whatever. It took them hundreds of years just to reach the uh, Guadalajara 700 River Valley. Years, River Valley. 700 years of war. You know, it's the, the reconquista is another, you know, great triumph of history, isn't it? Because you, you I, mean, I mean, you know, just think of us now as you know well i don't i don't even really i don't even want to say right wingers or traditionalists just healthy human beings Normal who are surrounded <laughs> yeah exactly who are surrounded by all this decay and and degeneracy and you've got to think well we might win but it might take 700 years we, we we're not going to be there to see it you know but it's we have to do it anyway you know if you're, it, it doesn't matter if you're 100 years or 500 years into the struggle, you still have to struggle, you know, bit by bit. And I think that Franco has the intelligence to understand that a long war is okay as long as you win in the end. He understands that he's giving up Madrid for something much more, much more deeply felt. I think among the Spanish right, you know, I think. 
I mean, I, you know, I, I said I said at the start of the stream, I, I'm not sure whether he was a man who advanced by luck or by skill. This is definitely a check on the skill side of that equation. He was he was definitely actively thinking about how he was going to um, unite the right wing of Spain behind him. Um, and this was basically, you know, part of the effort to do that. Because remember, he doesn't take Madrid till the war's over, more or less. You know, the, the, the entire four years, he is struggling around Madrid. It's a long siege. Um, and there's a hell of a fight that's put up by the uh, Republican forces there. And, um, of course, he says, okay, that's fine. So he pushes into Catalonia. He sweeps up to Cartagena. He pushes through the south takes all the areas around Madrid, you know, focuses on the north, etc. And also, he, he builds up a stable, he c- continues building up his power base while waiting for Madrid to fall. Um, and he's able to, he's able to, de- he's a great commander of, of resources and, and men, really, because he, he knows exactly where to stick the pitchfork in, if, if that makes sense. Um, no, he was quite brilliant. He didn't focus on these flashy, you know, victories in the news line. He focused on capturing uh, the areas with the grain and the farmers who are already loyal yep. to him. Just take those areas first, you know. And I forgot how early it, it was into the war, but fairly early on, he captured the grain resource rich uh, Castile um, and also yes. Andalusia, large parts of Andalusia, uh, the yep. farmland uh, and main food supply. And then he also Around Salamanca as well. Yes. He also captured the industrial rich uh, autonomous regions in the north, uh, mainly the Basque country, Galicia, Mm -hmm. and Pamplona from the Republicans. So, all of their their supplies, uh, everything you need to actually wage a war is taking that first. And inevitably, the city will fall. It's just a matter of time. So, ultimately, he's winning the long strategic battle first and foremost. He is. He is. And, um, one of the biggest deciding factors in, in in war in general, but especially when it comes to civil wars, the side that wins is most often the side that is able to maintain order in their hinterland, if that makes sense. Um, you know, this is what we see in um, in Russia. You know, the Bolsheviks are brutal, very brutal, but they maintain order. You know, whereas the white forces are chaotic because they've got no unified leadership. They're not sure exactly what they're fighting for. And there is no, um, there is no real way to, you know, keep order in the vast wastes of Siberia. You know, they don't, they, they can't, um, they can't actually give anybody a stable sense of life. Whereas if you lived in say Salamanca or La Coruña or any city that was taken on the first day of the coup and was held by the nationalists, life didn't change. Like quite literally, you. There were people who lived through it who said, if they lived in a nationalist area for the duration of the war, you wouldn't know the war was happening. Other than the fact that you often saw, you know, soldiers on leave or, or you know, wounded men coming back or this this sort of thing. Or they they saw planes in the sky. They said that the cafes were open. Everybody was still well dressed. Everybody was still polite. You could go and do all your shopping. You could go to work. You know, there was petrol for your car. You know, not as much as there were, there were, not as much as there might have been, but there was still, you know, you could get the train, you could get, you know, the churches were open. It was, it, life seemed perfectly normal. You know, your life wasn't disrupted. Now, if you lived in the Republican zone, it was, it was you know, totally opposite. You know, there were leftist factions fighting over where you lived every day. You know, there were constant shortages of food and essentials. There were minor famines. Um you know, endless political bickering, all the shops and restaurants would be shut. People, people began to kind of lose their, um, sort of civilized sort of, you know, uh, bourgeoisie mannerisms. People stop, people stop wearing ties and hats and they would be brawling on the street and public drunkenness and the police were corrupt and would be, you know, beating people up set for money and things, you know, it was, Nobody really wanted to live in the Republican zone. You know, you could you could be the most committed communist in the world. But the fact is, you know, would you rather be living in Salamanca or Barcelona in 1937? You know, most most people are going to make a very, very obvious choice in in that equation. Um, So, you know, that was another another reason that Franco was able to consolidate his power was because he could maintain order very effectively. You know, if you. 
decided that you wanted to go and cause trouble or you wanted to, you know, mess with a government power plant or, you know, try and break into an armory or, or a grain supply, you'd be shot. <laughs> you know, you would just be shot if you caused trouble, if you disrupted the war effort in any way, that was it. You got a bullet, you know, and if you're fighting a civil war, that is what you have to do. It's as simple. It's as simple as that. You, you have to have a very, very binary way of maintaining order. I mean, um, you know, it was it was as as long as you abided by the laws, and you know didn't cause any trouble. Then, as you said, life could go on as normal for you, more or less. Um, you know, so pray, pray that you did. But as, as I said, in the in the in the Republican regions, it was totally different. Um, you know, chaos everywhere. So. Yeah, I think that's per pertinent reason to why the whites actually lost the Russian Civil War is that they were. Well, a number of reasons why, but no, mainly they were disunified also. They angered yeah. the populist rural base of Russia, you know, their main like allies and recruiting base, they pissed them off to where they actually welcomed the Bolsheviks back in because at least they were orderly and weren't taking their stuff and see, you know, causing all the all these problems, which was a basically a fatal error, which uh led to Russia being under the control of the communists yep. for over ninety years. But that's quite important about how you treat the base and uh, how you mm -hmm. govern order uh, in order for the populist base to actually support you and your side. Yeah, I mean, an another example, I think, if I have this right, if I'm not misremembering, is the Chinese civil war between Chiang Kai-shek and the communists, where, again, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist Kuomintang, by the end of the Second World War, had become hopelessly corrupt and was somewhat confused in its direction whereas the communists were much more effective in appealing to the masses and could keep order much better i think and were much less corrupt um at the time anyway you know it's it's you as you said you have to you have to provide something for the people living under your control otherwise why are they going to live there you know and i think again it's important to remember that there are there are kind of non-material and material factors that are both important you know yes he took Toledo as great symbolic propaganda crusade victory for the, for the nationalists and the right wing as a whole. But he's also able to, you know, keep the cafes open, you know, keep food coming in. And to, to be fair, he does get quite lucky in this because he is able to get petrol, oil, food, guns, all the, all the stuff he needs. He gets it on credit from a number of American, uh, British, and I think uh, German industrialists, um, basically for free. It, it's on credit. But these people, the, these industrialists and, and, and financiers, they don't want a communist Spain. So they basically, they, they, they say to Franco, here's petrol, here's bullets, pay us later. Which is, you know, enormously helpful because it means that he can afford to he can afford to keep the cafes open. He can afford to, you know, um, go on the offensive whenever he needs to. He's got he's got spare ammo. He's got spare bullets. He's got spare guns, spare planes. You know, um, of course he has he has help from the Germans who send over the Condor Legion. Um, he also has some Italians, but I'm skeptical about saying that they're help because, to be brutally honest, and I, I know that uh, if uh, if uh, Furious oh, Perkinax is watching, is listening to this, <laughs> yeah, he's he's going to be annoyed. <laughs> but uh, I think the uh, the the cor I think it's Corpo Troppo Voluntare who go to Spain are um, it's a bit of a fiasco. Let's put it that way. Um, but that's a whole other topic. There is also a small Irish contingent that goes that are absolutely hopeless they spend most of their time getting pissed up in northern spain and rioting and and annoying civilians and eventually that they, they, they get sent home after um after not performing particularly well in battle um but other than that franco doesn't have many foreign volunteers um and the, the one of the great ironies is that the republican factions pride themselves on being you know the parties of the masses you know the communists the socialists the workers parties you know with millions of workers you know and it's worth bearing in mind that um, the Republican, sorry, the um, the largest trade union in Spain had over a million members, you know, clo close to two in some, some periods, you know. They do genuinely have a lot of popular support, the leftists, but they're useless at putting it to any use. You know, they are absolutely catastrophically bad at getting the men equipped, getting them trained, 
getting them in the field, getting them motivated, because, you know, there are, I'll, I'll, I'll just start talking about the, um, the, the, the disunity of the left in contrast here. Um, they're all fighting against each other more than they're fighting against Franco. You have the traditionalist Spanish Socialist Party, the PSOE, um, who I believe are, I may be mixing these up and I apologize, apologize if I am, but um, you have, they are basically uh, backed by, all right, I, I, sorry, I, I'm missing a trick here, but it's essentially the problem with uh, international leftism at this point is that you have Stalin and the Soviet the Union. Common turn, yes. Oh. Yeah, the common turn. You also have independent leftists who tend to back Trotsky, right? It's the old Stalinist Trotskyist struggle. Trotsky is, of course, still alive at this point. He's in Mexico. And there is a, a, a lot of infighting between these groups over what exactly is going to happen. You also have anarchists who, rather than fight the war, would rather set up their own communes and agricultural ventures, which tend to fail more often than not because, you know, <laughs> I mean, look, I, I, I'm, I'm actually not wholly opposed to cooperative um, agriculture. It can work. But when you're in the middle of a civil war surrounded by hostile leftist, leftists and the right wing slowly coming across the country at you, it may not be the best time you know, <laughs> to, to try and put your anarchist theory into practice. But I would you know. also just like to say one thing. If we just look at these types of people, and I know it's not an app comparison, but just look at Chaz uh, and their attempts at gardening. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And you just look at these people and you wonder how they're able to make their bed at night. Uh, well, I mean, to be fair, I think that's that's a little bit unfair on the Spanish anarchists. I know it is unfair, but... <laughs> the, 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 the Spanish anarchists came from, you know, very hard ag ag agricultural lives in a lot of cases. So, so they, they actually did know how to farm crops and, you know, live a, live a tough life. But yeah, the... The, the modern, you know, anarchists and leftists, you know, putting a putting a pot plant on a plastic sheet, you know, they're um, I, I don't I think it, I think once all the Walmarts and Wendy's and McDonald's close, they might they might be a bit hungry, but um, maybe they'll lose some weight. They, they could they could do with that. So it might help. them. Um, but yeah, um, it's how it is, unfortunately. But yes, uh, so the left are fighting against each other, the socialists are fighting the Trotskyists, fighting the Stalinists, fighting the anarchists, fighting the socialists, fighting the liberals, you know, it, it's all over the place. There's no clear leadership for the war. Um, in contrast to Franco's victory at Toledo, the leftists have Madrid, because, they're able, because despite all their military failure elsewhere, they're able to hold Madrid. And this is taken as a kind of... Uh, um, uh, as a kind of, you know, this this is this is their kind of uh, propaganda mythos. You know, um, no pasarán, they shall not pass, we shall hold Madrid. And they have uh, a woman called Dolores, I think, uh, Ibarui is how you say it, um, nicknamed La Passionaria, who is a communist um, woman who gives extremely forceful, powerful speeches about, you know, fighting for um, equality and freedom and you know, we're going to stop the fascists from coming into Madrid. And she is genuinely a very, very effective um, speaker and a, and a kind of propaganda weapon for the Republic. Um, and her, her speeches and her oratory and her presence do really bolster morale um, in, in Madrid and in other areas of the Republican front as well. So there is that. They, they do have some advantages. One big problem for the Republicans is foreign allies. Because... So, as, as you probably know, at this time, there is an organization called the League of Nations. And the League of Nations is most countries in the world, you know, it, it, it's a kind of proto-UN set up by Woodrow Wilson at the end of the First World War um, to resolve international disputes, led, led mainly by, I think, uh, Britain, France, uh, I think Russia's still a member at this point. I can't remember. They may not have been. Um, but basically, yeah, you know, Britain, France, America, no, America isn't in it. Sorry. They, they, they haven't joined. Um, I think Italy's left by this point, but essentially it's, it's Britain and France, the major European powers overseeing international, um, d d disputes over the world. And their response to the Spanish civil war is to set up a non-intervention committee because they can't really, to be, to, to, to be fair to them, they can't really meaningfully get involved. They can't. 
they can't openly back one side or the other because it, it, that's not what the League of Nations is supposed to do. Um, the League of Nations sponsors various humanitarian efforts. Um, in the south of France, they take in refugees from the Republican zone, thing, things like that. Um, but they but they establish that they will that the Le League of Nations members will not intervene in the war. Since America isn't a League of Nations member, all of its financiers and industrialists and oilmen can send Franco all the supplies they need. They're right, they can send guns, as I said, petrol, whatever. So Franco's doing fine for resources and military help. He also has Germany and Italy, who I think are both outside the league by this point. So that it, it doesn't it doesn't worry them. Obviously, the main backer of the Republic is going to be Stalin in the USSR. But the problem is Stalin is a very, very intelligent geopolitical player. And he spent a long time building up Soviet legitimacy with Western Europe. You know, he, he's had to, the, the Bolsheviks have to fight quite hard to get their diplomats and their foreign trade relations all squared out with other European nations. And he is also, of course, famously a devotee of socialism in one country, which means he isn't interested in this kind of Trotskyist theory of permanent, you know, revolution where we're taking the revolution into, you know, you know, here and here and here and here. And we're going to going to we're going to fund revolutionary activities all over the world. To He's not interested in that. And uh, to the <laughs> Rhone, essentially, uh, sorry, Trotsky wanted to do uh, to the Rhine and to the Rhone. Uh, yes. Trotsky yeah. wanted to do. That's 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 what he's interested in. But Stalin is too intelligent to do that. He knows it's not worth it. And um, now my personal opinion on this given my reading, and some historians would very much disagree with this, but my opinion is that Stalin actually deliberately sabotaged the Republican war effort in some ways. So, first of all, he there's a huge outcry in the Soviet Union, a, a popular outcry, you know, not, not just among the masses, but among, you know, Soviet politicians, generals, they say, we need to support, we need to support Spain, you know, our communist brothers are there we need to help them so initially stalin can't really you know just he, he he doesn't want to just go no to all of this there is there is a genuine fervor for it so there are you know money is raised and sent over and um they send some weapons and they send over some old tanks which by the way i will you know i talked about the republic's military incompetence one of the first things they do with these tanks is launch them in a massive attack against Zaragoza, which is exposed and they have all their troops riding on tanks, and they fight very bravely. But the nationalists just shell them. They, they, they don't have artillery, so the nationalists just shell the tanks. So all the tanks are destroyed, because they're just <laughs> blasted by artillery. An so, actually interesting so it, fact about the Republicans early on in the war, uh, because a lot of the coups in the cities failed, especially uh, yeah. on the Mediterranean coast of Madrid, uh, they just took the tanks that were in storage, and most of those tanks were actually World War One tanks. So yes, they actually Spain's... used a bunch of land ships and French uh, Renault T1 tanks, I believe is what they're called. Spain's they're armored corps was uh, lagging behind by the 30s. Yeah, <laughs> they, they were they were not foremost in tank production. But yes, basically, um, the Republicans um, have a sizable amount of tanks, but they basically put them to no good use at all. Um, and also they continue to they in the early stages of the war, they launch offensives with untrained militia against you know hardened nationalist veterans or or fortified nationalist volunteers you know and it obviously all goes wrong i will also point out there's a quite a it makes me laugh whenever i read about it and before i go back to the point about stalin is that <laughs> in order to prevent a military coup <laughs> there are, so so spain has about a uh, hundred thousand modern spare rifles for its army for its armed armed forces reserve basically which is double the amount of troops they have um in case there's a war and because they're worried about a military coup they store all the rifles in separate warehouses to the bolts you need to shoot so you know how like a, a bolt action rifle right the the bolt for that rifle is stored in a separate warehouse to the rifle itself so that if a military coup comes around they'll be deprived of working arms well, well guess what happened you could use it for firewood as you <laughs> well guess 
guess what happens? The coup takes place and the nationalists capture all the warehouses with all the bolts for the rifles in them. <laughs> so, so the Republic is stuck with tens of thousands of rifles with no way to shoot them. <laughs> it's a, it, it, I, it's a very, it, it makes me laugh every time. Just that, that the idea of, of this, you know, comedic situation where, oh, I know what we'll do. Oh, wait, <laughs> we can, we've got, we can't shoot, we can't sh shoot the rifles. So, this leads to, so again, again, you know, another problem for the Republic here is that there's very little equipment standardization. You know, they, they're using Polish and Mexican and French and, and you know, old Spanish. They, 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 all, all their rifles and artillery and small arms are different, whereas the Nationalists more or less um, universally use the model, I think the model 1908 Mauser, which the army was equipped with, which they have in abundance. And they're able to purchase more arms from abroad whenever they need them. Um, so, you know, again, <laughs> another another problem. And, and, you know, again, I know we're meant to be talking about Franco winning here, but a lot of it is that the leftists lost. You know, it's not just that he won, it's they lost. Um, and, of course, to go back to Stalin, um, I mean, this is one of the more famous incidents of the war. I, I, I can't really talk about whether or not this was a deliberate, you know, cynical ploy by stalin um or whether this the, the I, I can't i don't have the knowledge on hand right now as to what exactly happened I, I do have um papers on it elsewhere um oh hello hello am i, am I still you, in the stream yeah you're still here okay my my um you get out for a my, second but you're back okay so basically yeah the the incident with the spanish gold reserve where in return for a few thousand broken old russian civil war era guns and shells they send the entire Spanish gold reserve to Madrid, to Moscow. Um, and it's still there today. <laughs> the, the Spanish gold reserve is still sat in Moscow, as far as I'm aware. Um, brilliant. It, Once again, <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Um, they do this because in order to, to buy arms off the, off the USSR. But here's the thing. Remember, Franco is getting everything he needs on credit from financiers Th those are his his greatest allies in the initial in the initial parts of the war the republicans have to give their entire gold reserve for a few sub substandard rifles from russia if you have to give up all the money you have essentially where or, or basically the the basis of your financial um system to your ally they may not be your most fervent ally you know, if Stalin wanted the Republic to win, he would have piled them with guns and money, you know, as as anyone would, you know, if, if they want that side to win. I but he did. He also charged them interest for the. Oh, yeah. They had, they had to pay it. Oh, yeah. 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 There was. Also. Yeah. Yeah. It, wa it wasn't at all free. Um, although, to be fair, I think possibly the Republic just wanted to keep the gold reserve out of the hands of the nationalists. So they exported it to um, to Russia. But again, it's. uh Still quite a, a bizarre incident from the war. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's we talked about leftist disunity and rightist unity in this case. Um, I mean, to be fair, it's also, I think, somewhat easier for the right wing in this war because they can get rid of ide ideology completely. You know, it does. It doesn't matter if you're a, you know, a northern farmer whose granddad was a Carlist and you're, you know, a simple man. It doesn't matter if you're a, a wealthy young man who's, you know, nerdy and has read up on all the political theory and is a phalangist or just a just a simple young man from Salamanca who doesn't like what what the leftists have, have been doing to Spain. It doesn't matter. All you have to do is join up, get a rifle and fight, join the nationalists and fight the war. And, you you know, it, because to them, all it comes down to is. Would you rather live under the Republic with the anarchy and the terror and the killing and raping of nuns and priests? Or would you rather live under whatever Franco is doing? You know, what, why don't we finally end the political in instability in Spain and drive the leftists out for good? You know, why don't we finally crush the threat of communism and instability that we've needed to for so, so long in this country? It's a simple thing. It doesn't really matter what stripe of right wing you are you're going to be fighting for the nationalists or supporting them if you can't fight. You know, if you're a leftist, it's very different because, you know, if, if you're a diehard Leninist, 
you're not going to fall in with an anarchist. If you're a diehard, you know, kind of... Uh, a, a, a C and T member. Well, yeah, e exactly. You're not going to want to fight with, I don't know, a Trotskyist. Or the, 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 po the point is, there were a lot of Republicans, on top of all the other problems, there were a lot of Republicans who deep down would rather live under Franco than under a rival leftist faction, just because they have that much petty hatred against each other. You know, this is a big problem for them. They don't have a united front, a united figure to, f to face the war with. And, you know, it, it dooms them. So, um, yes. Is there any anything else in particular you want, me, you want me to cover, or should we go to a more general discussion at this point? No, I think that was a fairly good explanation uh, of how unity won, uh, essentially, over disorganized uh, opponents. I would just like to bring up this map real quick so we can jog up to more recent history uh, to give my personal anecdote about why Franco was allowed to exist because soon after World War II, um, the Soviet Union immediately, Stalin, uh, got his ire up about Franco still being allowed to be in power because, you mm -hmm. know, the U.S. was firmly now in charge of Europe with the defeated Germany and Italy uh, being puppets now and uh, a defeated and bankrupt Britain who was losing their empire. Uh, however... Luckily for Franco, what saved him, I think, from regime uh, revolution, like what happened to de Gaulle eventually in the 60s, was the Cold War essentially kind of, well, he was there, and he's not exactly uh, a liberal, but he's not a communist either. And so we're going to focus on the bigger strategic threat, which is the Russians in the East, which is why we're not going to unseat him. Well, more than likely. I, I, I think also there was just a general realist understanding of what Spain was. I mean, to, to put it bluntly, Spain is ungovernable. There, it's it's a nightmare of a country to try and pull together. You know, li all we have to do is look what happened in the 30s and the and the, and the Civil War and the, the 30 years l leading up to that. You know, it was, you know, the king couldn't do it. Other dictators couldn't do it. Liberal prime ministers couldn't do it. Dem Democratic prime ministers couldn't do it. The Republic couldn't do it. Only Franco could do it, you know, to actually, you know, bring Spain together for five minutes and stop stop the infighting and the, the chaos. Um, and I think that just generally, there was no, you know, remember, Franco isn't Pol Pot, you know, he's not he's he's not some tyrant slaughtering Spaniards on a whim. Once he's set up his power base, it's authoritarian by modern standards, but it's stable. And once they've got over the, you know, the phase of trying to develop an autarky, which, in my opinion, is a fruitless and I don't think autarky works, frankly. But um, well, once they've got past that, Spain begins to prosper, it begins to develop, agriculture catches up, you know, industry catches up, they, they begin to, you know, really, really de economically um, develop on, on par with Europe. Um, Spain is, of course, a staunch ally. And the fight against communism, um, you know, I, there's no need for the Americans to go in and take it over, is there? There's no need for them to un unthrown Franco because, you know, it doesn't, there's, 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 there just isn't a reason. There, there's not a single one. You know, what what would be the point of, of putting in the effort and the and causing upheaval in that country if you're just going to risk letting the communists back in? You know, I mean, and also you have to remember that the Civil War was was brutal in terms of how much it destroyed spain you know the country was in ruins after the war there were there was a considerable famine um from the through the late 40s to the uh was i think from 1948 to 52 there were sort of regional famines you know because the because the grain supply kept breaking down because there were the infrastructure war wasn't there and some some regions had just been totally de i suppose what would the word even be de-agriculturalized from the war you know all the men that farmed the land had died, or the land had been cleared out, or, or bombed, or all the crops had been seized for the armies. You know, it, it was terrible destruction in the country. And you again, this is the something America understood then that they didn't understand in the Middle East in the last thirty years, is that you can't go into a country, uproot and destroy it completely, and then expect a liberal, democratic, Western-style government to function there. It doesn't work like that. D liberal democracy only exists because it's a protection of bourgeois oligarchic assets. If you, 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 you can't just stick a, a, a pre an elected president in and expect it to run smoothly.
it doesn't work like that. You know, I think there was an understanding among higher ups on the on the NATO side that it made far more sense to just let Franco rule Spain. You know, um, I think the, the the really interesting question for us on the right wing is after Franco. You know, because unfortunately, as soon as he died and and King Juan Carlos took over, it was straight back to liberal democracy and straight back to you know the, the socialist party and you know look at spain now with a flagging economy a hopelessly corrupt administration and all of the leftism and wokeness and you know social trouble the that, revolution that we continues have. on uh, well, exactly all the stuff that we have here and on the and in america you know it's 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 you know unfortunately it, it didn't it didn't endure um that i think would have been impossible frankly because you know, if if Juan Carlos had stayed true to his upbringing and had, had been another Franco, I think you know by the time you get to the eighties and the nineties, America and the and the the forces of you know the pause. the the, 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 the GAE are, are going to be you know pushing for regime change and you know screwing with your economy and funding you know anti anti uh, anti state interests and things and funding leftism and funding you know, liberalism and things as America does. So, you know, I, it probably would have had to come, you know, it, or it, in order for, you know, it would have been like South Africa, probably where you just end up in a state of siege against the rest of the, the rest of the world, really. Um, I, I doubt it would have really been able to last as it did under Franco, but it's, it's a, it's a sad reality. You know, it's, it's, but the, I, I, I doubt, I doubt the GAE will tolerate, uh, you know, to tolerate a, a true opponent within its borders. I mean, to be fair, also, by the time Franco died, the country was very liberalized economically. You know, especially, you know, they, they had a very, very benefit, well, they, they, let's say they, they had a very prosperous relationship with, with America where the, the country was opened up to American business and investment and goods, etc. You know, by the time Franco died, Spain was economically where the rest of Europe was, you know, it was all part of the kind of global capitalist uh, network. So, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't a, there wasn't a, other than the political and educational spheres, there wasn't a great deal of difference between, you know, Spain and, I don't know what be a comparison, maybe Italy or, or something. France. Yeah. I mean, in terms of its economics on a grand scale, it wasn't very different. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, he was, he was able to unite the right until he died, and now the Spanish right is all over the place, as, as it was before. So, you know. Yeah, we see patterns quickly return as soon as, soon as that unifying central leadership is gone. Uh, yeah. But it was an accomplishment to achieve it in the first place, so we got to give him that. Uh, yeah, he did. He did save Spain from a much worse fate. Um, and I think the, the general trouble with Spain is, you know, from sort of 1900 up to um, the 30s, it's you know terribly backwards and and corrupt in terms of how it actually operates. You know, I think that the, there's a there's a common saying around the turn of the century, which is that Spain needs an iron surgeon, basically an, like an all powerful god type figure who can come and totally mend all of Spain's you know hideously bad institutional and societal problems and to an extent that's what franco is you know he conquers the country from the left and just rebuilds it from the ground up quite literally you know um you could you could go to spain in the mid 60s and visit you know ghost ghost towns that were still in ruins from the war you know it took a long time for all that to be rebuilt but um unfortunately you know he he attempted to build a corporate state you know, which very, very fascinating if you're on the on the right or a reactionary, because, you know, I think that if, if we ever did somehow take over a country, that's probably how you'd have to begin is by building a kind of corporate state like that, where you you you, you still have, you know, kind of post Renaissance institutions like parliaments and things. But you you, you change how they operate. You know, you, you, you build them around a more holistic, a holistic kind of um structure and you you give representation to certain groups of society rather than to in, rather than to individuals and things like that um but again it, it didn't last you know king juan carlos took over and rather than you know 
rather than having the stomach to fight on, he decided to take the easy route and um, and just become a typical European liberal democracy. And you know, look look where Spain is now. So. Uh, that's what happens uh, with modernity taking over slowly but surely. Uh, mm -hmm. And we see this even uh, after Franco was in charge, like the birth rate of Spain dropped significantly from the early part of the 1900s. Uh, it only stabilized under Franco, but as soon as he left, it just dropped like the rest yeah. of Europe. However, he was able to get it back up to a place from a birth rate, which is a feat all, all in itself, which is exceedingly, exceedingly difficult uh, in our modern age where <laughs> Europeans, uh, the current situation is extremely difficult to have children, uh, especially yeah. with the anti-human regime in charge of the West at the, at the moment. Indeed. Um, it, it may well be that Europeans just, you know, debreed themselves out of existence, unfortunately. But, um, let's pray that doesn't happen. Um, yes. Indeed. Well, I really enjoyed our conversation, Mr. Panama Hat. Um, so is I. there anything you would like to shill or... Uh, let our viewers know that you're doing um, before we close up no, the stream. I, I've still been very slowly wor I'm working on videos for my channel, but again, they're, they're, they're quite substantial ones. Um, you know, so uh, again, the next video is probably going to be the one on Colombia and um, President Loriano Gomez, um, but nothing really to shill as of now. Um, as for, I, I'll be appearing at Normos at the end of May, and um, I'll probably be attending. Um, shieldings as well in august um if you want to see me in person or have a chat or whatever um i'm i'm, a, I'm good, my you can shoot me a dm on twitter or or comment and i'll i'll add you on dms and things if people do want to chat about any of this because again i'm you know I, I i love talking about this stuff and, and discussing it so any of this um we didn't touch on the church much in this stream um but, you know, that's kind of a given that Franco had the backing of the church. You know, we don't really need to. <laughs> the, the, no, it's I, not really. The, the, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the Vatican did, didn't did exactly have a hard choice in deciding which faction to back. So, <laughs> you know, are they are, are, are they going to back Franco or the ones who are, you know, raping nuns and killing priests? Mm, I wonder. You know. mm. uh, but yes. Fairly easy choice, uh, mm. especially considering the fact they were <laughs> shooting priests in the street. Yeah. But... Anyway, I hope every I hope you all enjoyed the stream and have a good rest of your evening. And I'll see Indeed. you next time. Indeed, the same to you. Have a good day. And uh, oh, did